very touched by the Nevada boys. There were so few of them. People woke up to the fact that, look, you know, this is something different. You know, this is actually killing people. Looking back on it, something had changed. A moment had been lost. It was August of 1914, and in Europe, war was rumbling across the continent. They would call it the war to end all wars. 6,000 miles away in Nevada, the opening salvos of that war went largely unnoticed. Nevada faced its own turmoil in August of 1914. Some said the state was on the downside of the last boom economy, but certainly the economy was lethargic. Mining was unprofitable. Viable alternatives were few. Yet the last half of 1914 also proved to be a pivotal time. Nevada's future would be born in the election of that year. As America and Nevada joined the conflict in Europe, the progressive vision for its future would be tested. And at the end of the Great War, Nevada's future was teetering on collapse. In the sweltering heat of August, 1914, Anne Martin and her small army of suffragists launched their final push in a four-year effort to secure women the right to vote. This was the make or break year. After successfully passing a suffrage amendment in two previous legislative sessions, it was finally up to the voters and all the voters, of course, were men. Women who campaigned for suffrage were widely thought to be the engine of a, a number of moral reforms. Knowing that communities like Reno, Carson City, and Virginia City would defeat the suffrage amendment, Martin focused her campaign in the rurals, the small towns and mining camps scattered throughout Nevada. Now, Ann Martin was good at organization. She loved putting things together, and she managed to be the leader of a pile of wonderfully organized women all over this scattered state. And think of what it was like to get around Nevada in those days. It was really quite difficult. Uh, she rode in a car, she rode on trains, and they went every place they could possibly go in town, persuading uh, men to vote for them. In contrast to the seemingly tireless women, the two men running for governor in 1914, Tasker Adi, the Republican incumbent, and Emmett Boyle, the Democratic challenger, launched somewhat lackluster campaigns. Both men ran as progressives. He ran on a progressive platform, and progressive would be women's suffrage and a, a more effective way of, of doing business in government. I think he was a very popular candidate in that he was popular among Nevadans because he was a native Nevadan. Adi ran on an anti-gaming, anti-gambling. He wanted gambling out of Nevada, and he also wanted the divorce laws stricter in Nevada. Boyle, and he accused Boyle of wanting the opposite. Adi, who had supported Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party during the 1912 presidential election, was seen by many as unduly influenced by the state's economic powers. By contrast, Boyle was a relatively unseasoned politician. The son of a mining engineer, Boyle was born, reared, and educated in Nevada. Emmett Boyle was probably flagship of progressives. He, he represented the leadership of progressives, which did not have a strong base in the state. A betting man would not have felt that Emmett Boyle would have won that election. To the surprise of many betting men, the election of 1914 was an upset. Boyle defeated Adi by a 5% margin in a three-way race that included a Socialist Party candidate. Nevada's male voters, to the delight of Martin and friends, approved the women's suffrage amendment. Nobody seemed to know what was going to happen, so they were really quite thrilled. It was not a huge margin, but it was enough to do it. The Socialist miners, most people said, out in the state at large, who gave the votes that gave women the right to vote. Ann Martin, buoyed by the successful campaign, hurried to Washington to join Alice Paul in the Women's Suffrage Association. 
With the election of Emmett Boyle, Nevada appeared poised on the threshold of a new progressive era. Boyle believed in more efficient government. He also wanted to reform what he saw as a woefully inadequate tax structure, and he wanted to encourage alternatives to mining. Boyle always had, in every single one of his legislative sessions, he had a hard time working with the legislature. And not very much that he really wanted ever got passed. He tried to tell them what he wanted in his governor's message, and I don't think he worked very well, legislature. And almost every session, he had to sign bills that he didn't want to sign. I think that's one of his failings as governor, is that he was not uh, effective working with legislature. In the early months of 1917, the war in Europe finally engulfed America, and with it, Nevada. On April 2, 1917, President Wilson declared war on Germany. The war, Wilson announced, would involve the mobilization of all the material resources of the country. For Nevada, this war would affect individual lives as well as its entire social fabric. 